Hey, you are listening to Oh Crap Parenting with me, your host, Jamie Gorlacki. This is a podcast for conscious parents who drop the F-bomb a lot. Hi, friends. Welcome, welcome. So today I'm going to talk about sensory needs, meeting your kids' sensory needs and maybe lack thereof, (laughs) meeting them and, and our own as well. But first, my little nugget uh, that I heard in passing and doesn't warrant a full podcast, but I saw a pediatrician on Instagram and I thought this was such a good reminder. Post-COVID, we have a new thing where nobody's allowed to get sick. (laughs) Now, if your kid's in daycare or school, I'm sure you're well aware that there's sicknesses flying through schools. You know, those, once your kids start school or, or daycare or preschool, it's just petri dish in your house, right? But it's okay. We get sick. Even super healthy people get sick. Bugs, viruses, bacteria, things pass around. And I have definitely worked with some parents who are kind of going overboard on antibacterial, don't touch anything, no friends over. So the immune system, it does need exposure. It needs exposure to big and little things. And we don't have to purposely expose, right? But it does need exposure. And so we don't have to, we don't have to go to extreme measures to try to keep our kids healthy. And by extreme measures, I mean, you know, overly almost edging into sort of OCD compulsive behavior and tons of hand sanitizer and antibacterial coming out of COVID when we like, quote unquote, got back to real life kids were really sick because they hadn't been exposed to anything. And so just a reminder that we get sick. It's not, um, it's a major inconvenience. I know that, especially if you, the parent go down and the kids aren't sick is that's the worst combination, right? Like if you're both sick, it's great. If the kids are sick and you're not, that's fine. But when, when you go down and the kids don't, that's the worst, right? But it is, it is a normal part of the human existence. So, uh, let's make sure our kids, stay healthy psychologically too. (laughs) Okay. Sensory needs. So in our parenting community, which is called the Oh Crap Cafe, by the way, the um, waiting list has opened if you would like to join that. Mm -hmm. We had a mama who had said that she was trying her best to meet her son's very high sensory needs. He seems like kind of on overdrive, right? One of those kids that can go and go and go and go. And so she was, and she said, you know, it's almost seems like it's never enough. And that can, that can happen, right? Some kids are just high octane. They need extra, extra, extra. But what I wanted to talk about is different sensory needs because it's a hot word right now, right? Like sensory issues. Every single parent I work with tells me their kids have sensory issues. And this is when I did the interview with Erin from Spins and Stomps about being neurodivergent affirming, I had had this question of like, aren't we all kind of neurodivergent? Don't we all have like little glitches? We have our things, right? And she had, she had distinguished, you know, when it gets in the way of life. And so I thought that was like a really important thing because I do think we all have sensory needs and sensory issues maybe, you know, whether it's, I, I, I hate, um, uh, next, you will never see me with a necklace on. I don't like anything on my neck. I swear to God, I was choked in a former life or something. I started cutting sweatshirts, the collars off of sweatshirts and shirts when I was very young. I can't stand anything kind of tight around my neck. So is that a sensory thing? Is it a Jamie thing? Is it a weird thing? It doesn't interfere with my life, right? But I think coming out of the pandemic, I definitely saw an uptick in sensory higher sensory needs without any sort of diagnosis. So sensory processing disorder is a real thing. And that almost doesn't even look like uh, the typical, I don't like tags, jeans are too hard. I don't like the feel of that, not liking textures. Sensory processing disorder really has more to do with like the inability to flow through transitions. But coming out of the pandemic, for sure, I saw an uptick of sensory needs because I think kids were under lockdown, right? In a lot of places and they couldn't get their physicality out. They couldn't get that vestibular input. They couldn't get the proprioceptive. And yes, there are, oh my God, I see amazing accounts of like parents who 
do these wild, great activities with their kids. And we didn't have that capacity during the pandemic, especially if you were trying to work on Zoom. You got an older kid trying to do school on Zoom. It was it was crazy. So it's not a shock that kids came out of the pandemic, you know, uh, with higher sensory needs. But one of the things that I think gets confusing is when we use the term sensory needs, parents tend to think of those high octane kids. They think of, you know, big play, which is awesome, right? And again, that's the proprioceptive, the vestibular systems, right? And that's running down hills, rolling down hills, merry-go-round, spinning, tumbling, using the whole body in time and space, right? And that's very vital to the nervous system, to calming the nervous system, um, and to, to growth in general knowing personal space, knowing how to touch another person or hug another person without smothering them or knocking them over, right? That's a big thing that happened in like 2022, right? was like this, the like kids were just knocking each other over. They had no sense of personal space because they had been not, not um, having that proprioceptive and vestibular input, right? So, when we think of that, that's awesome. The big play, the whole movement, that kind of thing. But there are other sensory needs that you may not be picking up on. And so while you may be going crazy thinking, I'm, I'm meeting this kid's sensory needs. He's got sensory, you know, he's sensory seeking. And so I'm running him ragged. We're climbing on, the, you know, we're doing all these things and he still wants more. What I would encourage you to do is kind of observe and see if there are other sensory needs that you might be not picking up on. There's a vast variety of these, but some sensory needs are actual developmental processes and they're, they're quite normal. So I'll run through a couple of them. One is uh, dumping things. So dumping things usually is when the child's a little bit younger. It usually around, you know, 18 to 24 months. And all of a sudden they just walk around dumping things. If you have baskets of toys or baskets of sticks, um, costume baskets or pieces, you know, um, Duplo or Legos, or you have an older child who has, you know, doll clothes and that kind of thing. And the toddler runs around and just dumps everything. That is literally part of a developmental process. And so find ways for them when you see a child repeating a sort of behavior, especially one that is aggravating you, we want to correct the behavior. But what we can see is like, oh my God, this is, this child needs to do this. So you can set up you know, scenarios in which your child can dump. Maybe it's a sensory bin with rice and they can have containers and just dump things into other containers. You can have um, water bottles. You can, you know, cut the you cut water bottles in half or, or your Tupperware or glass containers and, you know, fill them with pom-poms or, or rolled up pieces of uh, paper that you're going to throw away or junk mail or something like that. And so they can have this like dumping and pouring into things. That is a developmental process. And it can look like, oh my God, my kid's tearing through my house. They have sensory, they're sensory seeking. And then you go bring them outside to do big play. You're not hitting that exact need. Yeah. Another very common one is, um, uh, 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 chewing on things, right? Constantly chewing on things. Now, of course, as toddlers, they're going to be getting some teeth. There could be teething going on. But beyond that, some kids chew on everything. They might chew on um, the edge of their shirt. They pull up the neck and chew on their shirt. Some kids will just chew pencils to pieces. My niece used to eat pencils, like eat pencils. She would chew them down till they were nothing. She would chew her nails down till they were bleeding. She was always chewing. Chewing is a, a self-soothing mechanism. It activates the vagus nerve and it can, it can, um, engage the parasympathetic nervous system. And so it can be very calming. This also goes for mindless eating, especially crunchy things. So if your child is constantly requesting like crunchy snacks and they seem to be eating very quickly or mindlessly, or you know they can't possibly be hungry, but they're kind of shoving food in, that could be a sensory need. And so one of the things you can do is help them learn to activate their vagus nerve in a different way. And that's, you know, deep breathing, Humming and singing is really great to activate that. So you can come up with other ways. They also um, 
if you, you can Google this and they have them on Amazon, even they have necklaces, which wouldn't be safe, of course, for toddlers that do have like a cone, a rub, a silicone cone that they can just kind of uh, chew on. Obviously some kids might be using a pacifier or you could have ch like two toys, you know, almost like teethers for a slightly older kid. When you see that it is a calming mechanism. So that could be aware of that if that's kicking in. Another sensory need is climbing things. I maintain that energy gets trapped in our body if we don't use the whole the whole body all the time. And I think what happens is we are very often with our kids, we're very heavily into running, you know, running sports, running around the playground. Yes, that can get them tired, but it might not be meeting the sensory needs of the arms that need pulling and, and action like that. So be aware of climbing and hanging. And so one thing you can do, especially if you live like in an apartment or you're, it's the dead of winter right now in the Northeast, it's very icy out. You know, you can't go to the playground. You can get a pull-up bar for your house. Make sure it's one that screws in, not there's pull-up bars that kind of go over a door jam. Don't do that because they can hop over the door jam and fall. But there's ones, it's literally called the perfect pull-up bar. It's the one I have. It's a great pull-up bar for you too. Everybody should do pull-ups. <laughs> But, um, and then you, they have home gyms where you can get like a trapeze or, um, rings. And now I see these all over the place. They have, um, you can screw them into the ceiling. It's almost like a hammock. It's almost like an aerial, aerial fabric, uh, device. It's, it's a fabric hammock almost. Um, and it hangs, it's low profile. It's almost like a, a sheet. If you were to tie up a sheet, um, uh, to two points and those can be great because the child can hang and swing. So look for in-home in-home products as well, right? Not just the playground, because that will get you very, very far. I have seen people more and more putting up a false board with rock climbing grips. If you have the capability to do that, that's amazing because that again, um, it helps with the climbing. And then if none of those appeal to you, just make sure you, you have a safe place for your child to climb. Make sure that they can climb on the furniture or if you have a rec room or their room, you know, you can make things safe by putting pillows down, taking things out of the way. The, um, but I would encourage you to pay attention to that climbing, even if it's maybe, I don't know, I had to teach my child to climb on the counter because he had no siblings to show him. <laughs> but I was like, dude, if you need, if you need the thing on the high shelf, like you got to learn how to climb the counter. Now, of course, you may not want that your child to do that, <clears throat> but honor the climbing as best you can and recognize that that is, it's a sensory seeking thing, but it's also developmental. And then the last one that I see the most, and again, it can look so aggravating, but it is a complete sensory need is moving things around. So if your child is constantly pushing and pulling chairs, if they are constantly moving things and trying to move the couch and move the coffee table, move their bed, they need heavy work. So honor that. Get a bucket full of rocks if you want to. I mean, that's how I train for my Spartan races, right? Laundry baskets that are full. Maybe even if you put something in it, like a gallon of water or something to make it a little heavier, just get two gallons of water from the store and come up with like a relay race so your child can like hold them or push them. But you want to address, excuse me, the sensory need that your child's exhibiting. And I find that most parents miss those, again, thinking that sensory input means like just going for it, just like getting them exhausted. Okay. On that note, what are your sensory needs? Because... I find that we as moms particular, and this can happen to dads, I think, definitely happens to if somebody's the primary caregiver and works, works, you know, maintaining the home and the children, uh, you know, burnout, exhaustion, fatigue, how are we, how are we filling our own cups and how do our sensory needs get met? So one of the things I think that happens very often to women is that mindless eating, right? Like mindless eating crunchy things. Ooh, it's so easy to mindlessly eat shit like chips, right? So <laughs> I, you know, I like the Boulder chips, the Boulder Canyon chips. They, they're, um, they don't have any seed oils in them. And it, oh man, if I open a bag of those, especially if I'm burnt out, it's gone. It's gone because I can feel that. And once I learned that chewing 
was a self-soothing mechanism and it and activates the vagus nerve, I became so much more mindful of that because I was like, oh my goodness, I that's one of my go-tos when I'm burnt out. And I obviously, because of like my Spartan races and having been an aerialist in the circus, I am keenly aware of needing to climb things. I am keenly aware of when I need to move something heavy. So just the other day I was, I was getting aggravated. Oh, I know what it was. I was editing, you know, I've got the 10th anniversary, um, rewrite for Oh Crap Potty Training and we're on the second round of edits and the copywriters are so aggravating. I don't know. If you're a copywriter, I don't mean any harm, but I feel like some copywriters, when they edit your book, it's like they're frustrated authors. They, they're, they're just very obtuse. And let me give you an example. I digress because I just have to tell you how aggravating this is. <laughs> so in my potty training book, I don't know if you've, if, you know, a lot of you have come to me by way of my potty training book, but I don't like to recommend specific books about potty training because I feel like everybody's got their own groove and you don't need specific books about potty training. Your kid's not really going to learn how to potty train by using a picture book, you know? And I think what happens is parents think they are, and they, they also like over talk. They over talk uh, potty training. So you got like eight potty training books and then they're talking about potty training and then the kid gets sick of it and rebels before even starting. I said, but I do think people really enjoy, um, I've heard people really enjoy the Elmo and the Daniel Tiger episodes on potty training. And so one of the copy editors said, you need to explain Daniel Tiger. So your, and your audience isn't going to know who that is. And I was like, could I get a copywriter who knows a little bit about kids? <laughs> so I was like, uh, no, don't worry about it. Everybody knows who Daniel Tiger is. <laughs> so, just these like little things. So I was getting super aggravated. I had to shut the computer and I was like, Ugh! and it had just snowed. And I went outside and just the, I love the cold, uh, the bracing cold. And I needed wood for my new wood stove. So I went and got, you know, I have wood stored. I got the wood and then I needed to chop some of it into like smaller pieces for kindling. And so I sat there with the ax chopping wood fuck, I felt so good. I, and I was just reminded, I was like, right. When we get aggro, sometimes we need to move heavy shit. Sometimes we need to work it off. Sometimes we need the bracing cold. Right. And I, i I put that under like sensory needs. I had, I needed some sort of input other than obtuse copywriters. <laughs> and so, um, it just, it, uh, it just changed my day in a matter of a half hour. And I was able to get back to editing and, are not be aggravated <laughs> anymore. So you guys know, I love working out. You guys know I'm all about it. I want you guys to get strong for menopause. I want you guys to get strong so you can be strong old ladies. I want you to be strong so you can lift your kids without hurting yourself. So you can do all the things you want to do. And I'm such a proponent of lifting weights, but this is another reason to just lift heavy. I'm sure you lift a lot of things. I'm sure you lift your kids and you lift, <laughs> you lift tons of groceries and you lift the laundry basket. And I'm sure that you get some heavy lifting in, but sometimes just moving pieces of iron just do the trick. You know, for me, the piece of iron was my ax. Chopping wood has to be the most satisfying thing, but that's one of the things I do. And it's, it's like half self-care, half sensory needs, right? And I think it's really important to pay attention to our sensory needs because they can make or break the day. I, at 55 years old, I am all set with bras. Like I am just all set with them. And when I have to wear one because of social convention, I can't wait. When I get home, if I don't take it off, I start ruining my own day without even knowing that that's the thing that's pissing me off. I also don't like, um, I like like really stretchy pants. Like I like athleta tights for when I work out, but they have some compression to them. I don't like compression on my belly at all. I like my belly just there <laughs> with nothing on it, nothing sucking it in. And I'll be, you know, if I like, I don't know, if I have to go do something fancy and I have to look fancy and then I get home and I'll start doing chores or whatever and I'll be short and yucky. And, and then I'll be like, Oh, I have something in my belly and I'm wearing a bra. I need to take these off. <laughs> so again, since I feel like in a non-diagnosable way, I, people really do. There are, there are people for whom things like 
tags on their clothes, jeans being too hard like that. It's, it's unbearable. So there are levels to this. There's a wide spectrum of sensory needs and sensory um, avoidance and sensory seeking. But I feel like there's a milder version that's not diagnosable. It's sort of like pop psychology, which is just like, eh, I don't, I don't like that. <laughs> so <laughs> being aware of it, but I would love to hear from you guys, you know, in this vein, what do you do for play? Cause we know for kids who are human and no different than us, we're just older what do you do for play? Because I think that's another component of sensory needs is big play. And when I realized that my, you know, I was an aerialist, which was strict training, but there was an aspect of like just being on a giant swing, really. (laughs) And then starting to do the obstacle course races and the Spartan races, which you go and you're like, well, shit, this is just a grown up playground. Like we're, we're literally crawling through mud to, you know, go on big merry-go-rounds and big monkey bars. <laughs> and so it's a version of play for me. And I'm curious what you guys do, because when we start looking at the sort of Venn diagram of sensory needs, meet self-care meets big play for grownups, where's that sweet spot for you? And can you think about that, right? I would love for you to start thinking about play. One of the things I went to, you know, I went to the Dominican over New Year's for a wedding and man, we danced our asses off. And I said, I want to start a nightclub called the wedding songs because, or the wedding, because they always play like the best music at weddings and everybody dances like fools. And don't you feel so good after that? You're like, Oh my God, that was so much fun. Cause dancing is a form of play, right? Especially that free form going, going crazy dancing. And so, and then when we have dance parties with our kids in the kitchen, right? We're like, Oh my God, that was so fun. And so I want to start encouraging you guys to have more fun. And what do you do for play? Because sometimes we're so structured and like, again, right now I have edits due. I have, there's a lot of things brewing in the background for, for Oh Crap Parenting. And I get very, very structured. You know, I, I wake up at 3.45. I have to do this by this time, this by this time. If I'm not cooking breakfast by 8.04, if Maverick's not out for a five-mile walk at, you know, uh, 5.37, like everything's very, very, very carefully tracked. And we can get very regimented like that. And certainly there are times in our lives, you know, when your kids are younger, when there's a strict routine maybe or a stricter rhythm to your life that you do have to be that regimented. But I think it's really worth like investigating within ourselves, what is our play? And, and maybe it, maybe it's knitting or crocheting or just listening to music, but we have to be conscious of that because when we're burnt out, I think the two most common things we do in this day and age is mindlessly eat and, or mindlessly scroll. And definitely I've been guilty of both and it gets us nowhere except more. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't satisfy. It doesn't hit the right buttons. It's not the right quality of shutting down and turning your attention to something else. And maybe for you, there's a lot of reading going on. Maybe if you can get some time to yourself, you'll just read a a good fiction book or, um, it doesn't have to be huge, but I do think we need big play as much as our kids do. And especially if you have a sedentary job or you don't do a whole lot of movement during your day, I think big play is just as important. So get yourself to a playground, get yourself to a a fun, if you can find a parkour or a ninja gym, those are the best, but have some fun, do some cartwheels, do a headstand, see if you can do a forward roll. (laughs) But again, we don't lose our need for proprioception and vestibular input and what's the saying? We don't, we don't get old. We don't stop playing because we get old. We get old because we stop playing. And so, yeah, I'd love to hear from you to see what you do for, for fun or play. If you have done anything recently or what, what would it look like if you did play? And I think that's an interesting question. And I think it can help us not only mitigate burnout and stress, 
but I think it can help mitigate aggravation with our kids because when you have time to play or when you seek out play as an adult, I think you have a youthful spirit about you and you, you have new neural pathways and you start to see something different. Like I had taken a couple of months ago, a ceramic, uh, I'd never done the ceramic not ce- pottery, pottery wheel. And it was so, it was so great. It was hard. It hurt my brain a little bit cause it was so new, but I also, I noticed this like more youthful feeling in myself because I was like, I just did something. I just did something I never, I've never done before. And I, I actually made some not lopsided pottery. <laughs> so, <laughs> All right. I'm going to wrap up for today. Uh, sensory needs, meeting sensory needs, self-care, big play, all the fun things. I hope this was helpful. As always, I appreciate you listening and as always, rock on. Okay. Bye everyone. Just a reminder, if you need additional resources, I have Oh Crap Potty Training. I have Oh Crap, I Have a Toddler. Those books are available everywhere you want to find a book. (laughs) You can also go to my website, jamieglowacki.com, where you can book private sessions with me, buy any of my courses. Those are really geared towards potty training help. And also I'm on Instagram. I'm not on Facebook anymore and I'm not on Twitter. I'm on Instagram, jamie.glowacki, and I do a lot of lives and uh, usually posting a lot of good information. So those are extra resources for you. And as always, rock on. Have an awesome day.